Diet that is only focused on nutrition is always going to fail. But a lifestyle revision, a lifestyle program that focuses on habit development, that focuses on psychology and nutrition might have a chance at creating some change for people. And, and the original word diet and its predecessor, diete or dieta, were meaning way of life. They, they didn't mean temporary alteration to your eating patterns so you can fit into that outfit for the summer vacation. It meant how you lived. If you want to live a long life, and look, nobody's going to live forever, but if you want to live a long life, and more than that, if you want to live a really nice life, then you got to take care of your health. you got to take care of your nutrition. And you're not going to do that by going on a six-week cabbage soup diet or watching your weight. You're going to do it by changing your lifestyle. Very smart advertising executives and marketing geniuses in the food industry, in the sweets industry said, geez, you know, we got to take a look at how this is working. Um, we, 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 we can get people to relax their rules for themselves and their kids if we make them feel like eating sweets is going to bring them closer to this festival. I mean, that's what they did. They got that idea because the sweet companies came along and they said things like, you had a rough day, you deserve a break today. Kit Kat, right? Sitting in an outdoor cafe on the Champs-Elysees, you know, looking at the Arc de Triomphe and you're having a nice meal. And then some French dude sits down with his little beret and he, and he lights up a cigarette. And you go, hey, dude, what's with the cigarette? We're having lunch here. And he goes, I am French, I will smoke. Smoking is very French, don't you know? And you know, to take your American habits and you can go somewhere else if you don't like it. Tobacco comes from America. It's not French. When they first came along, they really came along as a convenient way of holding food. You know, in other words, it was like, I need, I need, I need, to, I need to take some food with me as I go work in the fields. So I'm gonna make this chapati and I'm gonna put vegetables inside the chapati and I'm gonna roll it up and that's how I'm gonna hold my food. Hey everybody, welcome to the Being Different show. The goal of this show is to introduce you to people and ideas that can allow you to take your life to the next level. Today on the show, we have with us a very special guest who is an expert at nutritional anthropology, behavioral change dynamics, evolutionary psychology, marketing, business freedom, public speaking, and a lot of other key interesting fields. He has spent his life starting businesses, running transformational trainings, and more importantly, educating people about nutrition and helping them live a better lifestyle. He's the founder of Wildfit, Speaker Nation, and Business Freedom. He's a world-class speaker and has shared stages with Sir Richard Branson, John Gray, Jack Canfield, Robin Sharma, and President Bill Clinton. He's also an author on Mind Valley. In 2018, the Canadian Senate awarded him a medal for his mission to improve the people, quality of people's lives. So guys, please help me in welcoming the man who is transforming the lives of people all across the globe and leading them to live a healthy lifestyle, Eric Edme. Eric, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So Eric, what led you to start Wildfit in the first place? What's your story? That's actually kind of a, a long story, but if I give you the short version of it, it, it comes in two phases. The first phase was that I was very unhealthy and sick and overweight and what have you. And um, I had been visiting doctors and specialists to try to get to the bottom of my various problems. And they'd been prescribing all kinds of different medications and treatments and nothing was helping. And, uh, you know, I sat down and had a conversation about food with some friends of mine and decided to undertake a bit of a, an elimination diet, you know, like try to figure out what was causing the problems. And uh, a month later, I had lost uh, 35 pounds, maybe 15 kilos. I, I, all of my symptoms were gone. I was sleeping properly. My headaches were gone. Digestive problems were gone. And I'd fixed it all in only a month after years of visiting doctors. And so that's kind of step one is that I became incredibly curious about why it was none of my doctors talked to me about food ever. You know, I would make the assumption that um, in their training to become a medical doctor, they must have studied nutrition. This, of course, turns out to be an incorrect assumption, but, you know, it, it, it just woke me up. Now, phase two of what stimulated me to want to create WildFit was that people all around me would ask me how I did this and they'd ask me for advice, but I would tell them what to do. I mean, I knew what to do. I dove in, I did the research. I could tell them what to eat more of and what to eat less of and all this sort of stuff, but then they wouldn't make the changes. I, I mean, I, they might make the changes for a few hours or if they were very lucky for a few days, but then they would just go right back to their old patterns. 
And that's when I decided that a diet that is only focused on nutrition is always going to fail. But a lifestyle revision, a lifestyle program that focuses on habit development, that focuses on psychology and nutrition might have a chance at creating some change for people. And so uh, in 2012, I put that whole idea together in a single 90 day program that became the start of WildFit. And uh, I really thought it was a hobby. I had no idea where it was gonna go. I mean, it was an experiment and a hobby. And of course, here we are today, uh, having, you know, having served some 35,000 people in 130 countries around the world and not a day goes by that we don't get letters from people that have, you know, reversed their diabetes or lost lots of weight or put their disease into remission or ended their inflammation, basically feeling better. And uh, so it's, so WildFit has been a real um, passion project of mine and I'm very proud of what we've achieved there. It's incredible to see how someone's hobby might transform the lives of people. And it's incredible to see that, you know, when we use the word diet, there are so many buzzwords that goes around diet. And I'm on this diet, people say I'm on this diet, but they eventually don't end up like becoming healthy after that, those diets. What do you think the word diet means to us? And what does it mean to you? Well, I think that's one of the issues is the word diet itself is a buzzword. You know, the, 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 the words, language is interesting. It, 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 um, it kind of takes a life of its own and it evolves over time. And, um, so in order for us to really understand what diet means, we should look at the original meaning, right? The, the, the original intention behind the word. And, and the original word diet and its predecessor, diete or dieta, were meaning way of life. They, they didn't mean temporary alteration to your eating pattern so you can fit into that outfit for the summer vacation. It meant how you lived, your way of life. And so the truth is, is that when people go on a diet, what they're really doing is they're going on a restriction program that takes them off their diet. And, and their diet is what's killing them. Their diet is what's causing them to gain weight or be sick or be in pain or not sleep or lose fertility or whatever the case might be. And then they're going off that diet onto some restriction program, which of course isn't going to work. And then they end up going back on their diet. What really we need to do is change people's diet, change their lifestyle. And that's really, that's really what we've devoted our work to doing at WildFit. You know, I see a lot, of, a lot of times you talk about that people don't fail diets. It's the diets that fail people. What do you mean by that? Well, it's exactly that. People, you know, what will happen is that a lot of times people will go on a diet and then it won't last for very long for them. For some people, it's hours you know some people it's days a few people it's weeks and then a few people it might even be months and they might get somewhere but then in the vast majority of cases like 97 percent of cases they will go all the way back to where they started and often even worse and so they then feel like a failure they feel like they failed i mean the diet that they followed there seemed to be lots of cases that it worked and so when it doesn't work for them they feel like a failure but what they don't know is that Statistically speaking, even the cases that are shown in the book or shown in the diet, if you were to go and check on those people a year or two later, most of them have gone right back to where they were before. But what you're seeing as the evidence that the diet works is the evidence of the ideal moment of the ideal client, which is an infinitesimally small percentage of the overall clients. And so people end up feeling like they failed and then their self-esteem goes down. And as their self-esteem goes down, their food decisions become more deplorable. So, for example, somebody who is feeling incredibly good about their body and incredibly good about their life, they're less likely to, I don't know, drink a big can of Coke. They're just less likely. But when somebody's feeling down or they're feeling low self-esteem or, you know, what have you, then how you treat your body doesn't seem to matter so much. And then it's really easy to suck down a Coke. And so what we say is that it's not that people fail the diets it's that the diets fundamentally and consistently and continually fail people and they fail people by causing them to do stupid things like counting calories or restricting calories i mean i know it seems to make sense if you want to lose weight you should put in less calories but that's not the biochemistry of it that's not actually how it works it sounds like it makes sense, but it only makes sense in the way that terrible Wall Street accounting can cause a company like Enron to completely implode upon itself because it's bad accounting. And most diet programs are based on things like bad accounting, bad assumptions, and bad myths. Here's one good example. A diet comes along and says, don't eat this. 
Well, here's what's really crazy. Ever since you were little and I was little and everybody was small, one of the things that happened was whenever we broke the rules, whenever we ate something naughty, we released all kinds of feel good chemicals in rebellion, right? It's like you, you, it's like rebellion feels good. And so now the diet is set up to make you feel like a failure. And the best way to reward yourself is to break the rules. Then you feel like a rebel and you're getting all these feel good chemicals. Then you're eating horrible junk food that's causing massive dopamine production in your body. And the next thing you know, your diet has failed you once again. And you end up feeling like a failure, which is perfect for them, by the way, because then you don't blame the diet. You blame yourself. No, people don't fail diets. Diets consistently and continually fail people. What people really need is lifestyle revision. They actually, there's no temporary change you can make that's going to achieve the long-term results for you. If you want to live a long life and look, nobody's going to live forever, but if you want to live a long life and more than that, if you want to live a really nice life, then you got to take care of your health. You got to take care of your nutrition. And you're not going to do that by going on a six week cabbage soup diet or watching your weight. You're going to do it by changing your lifestyle. You see, that's, that's very interesting because humans are emotional beings and we make decisions based on the emotions we're feeling. And a lot of times we end up eating a lot of food because we're feeling a certain way and the food makes us feel certain way. And I think you talk about how the food industry has taken advantage of it and how they've influenced their marketing in that way. So how do you think our food choices are being influenced? There, there are so many ways. Um, there are so very many ways. Tell me, where, where do you live? India. Right, I know, I know, but where, where in India? Central India, Delhi. You live in Delhi. Central India. And so um, w- 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 during Diwali, what do you eat? Sweets, a lot of sweets. Right, and when were sweets invented? Like recently, right? Like, I mean, they're a yeah. very new invention. And when was Diwali invented? Like a lot of years ago, like yeah. hundreds so, and hundreds of years ago. So how is it possible that sweets have anything to do with Diwali? Wait, how is that possible? And yet you have a generation of kids growing up in India right now that think that Diwali e- means sweets. Yes? That is true. So what happened there? Very smart advertising executives and marketing geniuses in the food industry, in the sweets industry said, geez, you know, we got to take a look at how this is working. Um, we, 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 we can get people to relax their rules for themselves and their kids if we make them feel like eating sweets is going to bring them closer to this festival. I mean, that's what they did. And so now all of a sudden, there are people who feel like they can't even celebrate Diwali or Easter or Christmas or any number of the different celebrations around the world. They feel like they can't do it without sweets. And that's, that's something the candy companies did to us. Look, I, I don't know a great deal about um, Indian festivals. I, I know a little bit, but I, I went to a Christian school, so I know a lot more about Christian holidays. And what I can tell you is, is that I remember the nativity story, the story of Jesus's birth. And the way it worked was Jesus's mother got pregnant. Nobody really knew how that happened, but it happened. And then what happened after that? He was born in a manger, right? He was born in a manger and, and there were sheep around. And then the three wise men came and they brought frankincense, myrrh and gold. Not one of them brought candy canes or chocolate. And yet those things have become ubiquitous when it comes to Christmas. And incidentally, in the sequel to that story, you might remember the Easter story, when that same little boy had grown up and then they decided to put him on the cross. There, where, where's the chocolate in that story? But somehow the chocolate companies have managed to make chocolate so integral, to so, so key to the Easter experience that there are people who feel like it isn't Easter if they're not eating chocolate. Now, I'm using holidays as one example, but now we have to go a step further and recognize that the food industry has not just done this to holidays, they've done this to every emotion they can. So what do people eat when they've had a really bad day at work? Junk. A donut. They got it, they got it. like, hey, t- tell me, in, 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 in India, if somebody had a really bad day at work, what are they gonna eat? Mostly junk food, donuts, sweets, a lot of chocolates. Okay. Even All Coke right. sometimes. And where the hell did they get that idea? They got that idea because the sweet companies came along and they said things like, you had a rough day, you deserve a break today. Kit Kat, right? Like yeah. they, they, they've created that for us. And now, now, wait a minute, tell me, wait a minute. What if you have a really great day at work? What do you eat? What do you eat if you had a really great day at work? Celebration. 
Celebration. It's Celebration. That's the chocolate name. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now, now you, if you had a really great day at work, you also have to eat sweets. I see. Okay. So if you had a bad day at work, you got to eat sweets. And if you had a great day at work, you, you got to eat sweets. Pretty soon, you got to eat sweets. If your friend's dog's uncle's pet cat had a birthday, you have to have some sweets, right? They've, what they're looking for is triggers. The food industry is constantly and continually trying to find triggers to make people make exceptions. And so they do this so often that the exception has become a rule, the rule. And the vast majority of people are eating phenomenal levels of sugar and they don't even know it. Now, I don't know the statistics for India, but what I can tell you is that the average American eats over 150 pounds or 70 kilograms of sugar every year. They weren't doing that 100 years ago. Oh, and incidentally, diabetes and obesity are exploding all over the place. I wonder if there's a relationship. The food industry is not on our side. They are on the side of their shareholders and they're on the side of profitability. And I'm, by the way, not suggesting that any one person in the food industry is particularly evil. What I'm suggesting is, is that step by step, incrementally in their pursuit of profits, they are more concerned with profits than they are with health, your health, my health or anybody else's. And when I get to realize that, immediately I see those sweet items as being triggers for me to eat something. And that just changes me and like puts me in a different stage altogether when I'm like seeing those food items. You know, a lot of times we eat something and, and we are full, we feel full that we're having, we eat a lot of food and we feel full and within a few hours only we feel hungry again. And that happens a lot of times. Why do you think that happens? There, there are a number of reasons, uh, but if we focus on two that are very powerful, the one is that most of what we eat is um, nutritionally useless. And so you eat it, your stomach feels full, but your body still feels hungry. So you go, you know, like uh, uh, as a perfect example, when you sit down to a plate of overcooked lentils on chapatis, you're eating nothing. There's nothing particularly useful in that meal. There's a, it's not, it's not full of gorgeous, you know, vitamins, and minerals, and amino acids, and things that are going to really build you a strong body. But they taste good, and they feel good, and they go in, and they fill your stomach, and so you kind of feel like you've done something useful. But in the meantime, as your body is monitoring nutrition levels, it takes a look and says, "Wow, that's weird. I, I feel like we ate something, but I don't feel like we got much from it." And so then you're hungry again later. And then that's amplified by another thing. And that is that when we eat carbohydrate foods, we spike our insulin levels. We produce insulin to break down and process and burn and store the sugar that we've just eaten. But the trouble is, is that particularly with the hot burning sugars, but all carbs, when you do that, you, you, you eat the sugar and the carbs, the, 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 the carbs come in and the insulin spikes and then your blood sugar starts to come down and then you're left with excess insulin, which creates a sugar craving. And so then that makes you hungry again. And that's why somebody who eats one sweet wants to eat two, who wants to eat three and four. Now, this may seem like a terrible mistake on behalf of God or evolution or whatever the origin story is that you believe, but it isn't because you see for many, 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 many millennia, for thousands and thousands of years, our ancestors were battling against starvation all the time. Remember, they didn't have refrigerators and storage and agriculture and stuff. So, so they were battling against starvation. So then what happens? Well, you walk along and you see a fruit tree and you know that the fruit's only going to be ripe for a few days and you might only be hungry enough to eat three pieces, but your body knows that you had better eat more than three pieces because, you know, winter and drought is coming. So you got to, you got to stock up. So you eat three pieces, you feel full, but your body loves all the sugar and it starts producing endorphins. Now, endorphins are natural painkillers. So it starts to numb the full feeling in your stomach. It starts to numb it down. Plus on top of that, the insulin spike makes you go, oh, I want more. And the next thing you know, you're back at the bush and you're eating more and you're eating more and you're eating more. And all of that is by design, by the design of evolution or by design of the creator, whatever anybody believes, but it's by design to make sure that you survive the next period of lack, the next period of drought. If you didn't have that, then, well, if your ancestors didn't have that trait, you wouldn't be here. But the problem is, is that that means today we have a system to shut down our full feelings when we get full and a system to trigger us to eat more when we eat sugar. And now we have sugar everywhere. And of course, this is a, this is a bit of a problem. That is very true. And, you know, Eric, I, I see you talk a lot about 
types of hungers and that we only address certain kinds of hungers what do you think are the kinds of hungers and how do we address those well in wild fit we talk about um six different types of hungers and the way this came about was that um we would very often have um you know, we very often have people like trying to dive in and figure out why they were eating something. They were confused. Like, why am I making this eating decision in this given moment? And, and so in the early days, one of the big parts of the exploration we had was trying to figure out what drove people to eat. Like, what was it that made them want to eat something? And, um, and so as we started looking at the different decisions people were making and the different motivations, we identified that there were effectively six core reasons that people ate. And only one of them was about nutrition and that's called nutritional hunger. And, and, and so let's first talk about that, that the majority of people are eating in a way that feeds them too many calories and not enough, um, too many calories and not enough nutrients, not enough non-energy nutrients. And so what happens when that happens is of course they are hungry. And, and then, then somebody wants them to go on a calorie restriction diet. Right. But they were already hungry. They were already starving. And now you got to cut your restriction even further. So when we figure out how this um, these hungers work, we can take a look and go, well, step number one should be to make sure that we are eating really nutritionally full things, because then we can eliminate the only true hunger. And that is nutrition. So when we are eating a wide variety of vitamins and minerals and amino acids and we're topping up all of our nutritional needs, then we will neutralize actual nutritional hunger which is a good thing. But then we have to look at the fake hungers or the false hungers. So for example, one of the false hungers is thirst. Now this may sound a little bit odd, but you know, what do you mean thirst? I, if I'm thirsty, I drink water. But for, for most of human history, we did not have water bottles or pottery for that matter. And so when somebody was uh, um, hungry, sorry, when somebody was dehydrated, well, because a lot of the water that our ancestors took in, they took in by eating water rich foods. And so when they were feeling dehydrated, their body would send them a message. Hey, go eat something. We're, we're running low on water. And so you would go eat some, some, some vegetables that were full of water or some fruits that were full of water or some meat, because when you're a hunter and you eat fresh meat, it's full of water. So you would then be eating lots of water. So of course today, most of the food we eat is unbelievably processed and full of. And yet still we have this old message, hey, you're a little dehydrated, go eat something. And then we go eat a chapati or a bag of potato chips and we don't get no water. And so then we get the message again, geez, you're still thirsty, go get something to eat. So by keeping ourselves really well hydrated, we can shut that hunger down. If you stay really hydrated, then it's one less motivation to make improper eating decisions. On top of that, there's you know um, uh, what we call emotional hunger, uh, where people just eat to solve an emotional problem. I'm feeling lonely, so I'll eat some chocolate. Obviously, we would recommend finding a different way to fill the emotional hole than, than food. Mm -hmm. um, there's also low blood sugar hunger, and this happens when people have mismanaged metabolisms. When, they're, when they don't have good metabolic health, they experience big swings in blood sugar. And of course, when their blood sugar plummets, then they are moody, angry, and they're willing to eat anything to solve the problem. So it's very important to make sure that people manage their metabolisms and keep a healthy metabolic system so that they don't have these big crashes. Also, humans have a craving for variety. So you've probably had this conversation yourself at some point with your parents, or if you've got kids where it's like, I'm hungry. Okay, well, here, we have some of this. I'm not hungry for that. <laughs> okay, well, if you're not hungry for that, you're not hungry. Right? That's just what's going on is that your body is calling out for some variety. Now, if you have a nutritional hunger problem and a variety problem, there's they compound on each other. And this is the way that works is that your body knows that it needs a wide variety of different nutrients. And so if you are running low on some nutrients, your body will ask you to seek a wider variety of foods to hopefully get all those nutrients. So again, very important to stay well nourished because then the craving for variety will be somewhat lower. So, you know, I, I think that's all six. So it's like thirst, nutritional, hungry. Uh, uh, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't get the sixth one. The sixth one is empty stomach hunger, which is not a form of hunger at all. It is a simple physical state, the state of having an empty stomach. But again, for most people in the Western world, they are constantly malnourished. Again, eating too much energy, 
not enough non-energy nutrients. So they are constantly hungry. Then when their stomach is empty, they're like, wow, I feel this way because my stomach is empty. But when somebody is well hydrated, well nourished, has their emotions working well for them, and then their stomach gets empty, all they feel is an empty stomach, no hunger. They don't feel the immediate need to fix it. They don't feel the immediate need to solve it. What many times, once people get used to fasting and that sort of stuff, is they recognize that an empty stomach is actually a really pleasant feeling for some time, for a period of time. And so getting used to the idea of an empty stomach as not a painful feeling can be very empowering for people as well. The more they understand these six hungers, the more they can analyze their individual eating decisions and make more conscious or better food choices. Eric, you know, in India, a lot of our food comprises of chapatis. And I mean, we have it like at least twice a day. And and chapati is the core food that we have on the plate. And there are sub foods and, and vegetables that we have that we have with chapati. And I think it's really hard for people to break away from that. What do you think is the replacement and how do we deal with that? Well, you know, I, I think we, we have to look at the way we can, what we consider to be traditions and habits and so on. Here, here, here's a crazy example. If you travel to France, um, the French are very proud of their food and very proud of their culture and their lifestyle. They're so proud that they, that where many other languages, like um, I suppose you speak uh, Hindi. Yeah, I do. Okay, but now as technology, like how do you say internet in, in Hindi? I mean, we say internet only. <laughs> oh, oh, you say internet only. You see what happens in most languages is, is that as a new word comes up, it kind of gets adopted into all the languages. So, you know, you, you would find that if you're here in Estonia where I am right now, they say internet. When you're talking Hindi, it's internet. But what happens in France is they're so proud that they don't want to take these English words. They're very proud and they want to hold on. So they make a new word and, and we're not going to take on these English words. Well, if you take that idea of culture, which I think can be very empowering at times, but let's take it a step further. You're sitting in an outdoor cafe on the Champs-Élysées, you know, looking at the Arc de Triomphe and you're having a nice meal. And then some French dude sits down with his little beret and he, and he lights up a cigarette. And you go, hey, dude, What's with the cigarette? We're having lunch here. And he goes, I am French. I will smoke. Smoking is very French. Don't you know? And, you know, to take your American habits and you can go somewhere else if you don't like it. Tobacco comes from America. It's not French. It's, it's not French at all. It's that the tobacco companies have hypnotized them into believing that smoking is a French activity. It's not. It's, a, it's an original American activity that was imported only about three or 400 years ago to Europe. And so I would say to you that we want to look at these things and go, do I, do I really want to hold on to this particular tradition, even though it might be harming me or it might be causing me difficulties? And so, you know, what I would say is something like, like um, the, the, the tradition of Trabatis, I think if you look at it, what you'll find is, is that when they first came along, they really came along as a convenient way of holding food. You know, in other words, it was like, I need, I, need, I, need to, I need to take some food with me as I go work in the fields. So I'm going to make this chapati and I'm going to put vegetables inside the chapati and I'm going to roll it up. And that's how I'm going to hold my food. And, and, and so it's like, but the next thing you know, it's like, now we have to have chapatis at every meal. What do you mean? I have a knife and fork here. I don't need chapati. And so I think what we have to do is consider, first of all, consciousness. Do we really need these things at every meal? Does it really define our identity? Are we so controlled that we must do it that way? But then the other way is this. Wild food is ultimately about freedom. And if you want to have them, you should have them. My only thought is this. Since a chapati is nutritionally not such a great idea, the grains are, are, are not so good for us. And, generally, and then, so you have to ask yourself. To what degree is my identity going to be controlled by somebody's excellent marketing or some idea of cultural tradition? And to what degree do I want to eat this thing that is full of grains that's not ideal and it's probably fried in the worst quality fat? So what do I want to do? And all I would say is this, because we ultimately are about food freedom. We're ultimately about you making the decision to eat what you want when you want. So my question is this, are you eating a meal of chapatis with a little bit of vegetables or fish or meat if you're not a vegetarian? Are you eating a, or, are you eating a healthy plate of food and using chapatis as the delivery mechanism? And, and I would say that that might be a better way to do it if you must eat them at all. That's interesting because a lot, I mean, throughout our lives, we've been told that chapatis is your food. And, and if we replace them, we don't, we're not having food. So that is <laughs> our food. 
and that makes me wonder what could be the alternatives to a chapati like we are already having some vegetables but there's like chapati that forms the core element of our food and we remove that so what could be the alternatives to that well i i think that one of the things we have to recognize is do you really need an alternate do you really need to replace it with something similar or what have you like we we see all these people in america now trying to figure out ways to make fake meat well why if you don't want to eat meat don't eat meat but why do you need to create a fake version of it why do you need a replacement of it especially if you don't believe that you should be eating it right and and so i would look at at chapatis and say do you really do you really need to replace them it's a habit it's like sucking your thumb do you, you there's no real nutritional benefit in it it's just it's just a habit now the difficulty is of course how do you go to your next big you know indian family uh dinner and explain to your relatives oh i don't eat chapatis anymore that's not so easy you know that's not so easy but i think that what we could do is we could take a look at making uh at alternate ways of making chapatis um uh here's here's an example from my own life um pancakes were always a big treat for us when we were kids and i you know i still like to have pancakes from time to time but generally speaking when i have them i prefer not to have them made out of wheat flour because i know that wheat flour is not that ideal for my digestion i just don't i don't enjoy it and frankly most people should have a uh you know a different they should consider the relationship with meat with wheat i should say so so in the case of pancakes if i'm going to make them i found a number of different ways to make pancakes one example crazy but if you take a big banana and crack and and mush it into mush and crack one egg in and turn it into batter you can make really nice pancakes and they don't even taste heavily like bananas you can just make pancakes well by the way you know what a pancake is it's a kind of chapati So so try it. Go make yourself go, honestly take out a banana, a ripe one. It's got to be ripe, and, you know, and and mush it up with a fork, stir it in harsh with with an egg or maybe two, and then and then crack it into a pan and you've got a you've got a pancake or chapati replacement. But then also you can take a look at the different types of flour like almond flour or other flours that say don't have gluten in them because some people are irritated by gluten. So on one level you can look to replace things and then the other level you can look to say why do i need to replace it at all do i really need this in my life and you know i don't i certainly do not need pancakes in my life every day and i don't even come close to doing that i i i eat them on rare occasion and when i eat them i choose to make the ones that i think are going to be most neutral to my digestion because i don't want to eat the ones that are going to hurt me that's interesting to hear you know eric i also wanted to talk about like dairy we are so big on dairy as well and i read one of your yeah. ebooks it was about the dairy myth it was a well researched paper that i read what do you think the dairy myth is and and how did that prevail well you know um it's kind of funny the uh um i imagine that the consumption of milk uh started what what it appears from the archaeological record is that milk first started getting consumed less than 10,000 years ago and most of that um behavior started in northern europe and then kind of spread its way out from there um and uh it's still considered a very new behavior and so the vast majority of people on earth are lactose intolerant or or at least lactose irritated even if they don't know they are because when something is irritating your system and you drink it all the time your system kind of finds a way of dealing with it and putting off the pain so you don't suffer the pain every day but you will suffer the pain eventually and so um over time i think that there are a number of different uh factors that made milk become such a key uh part of um of of you know various cultures around the world one one of those is that um, during the world wars it was incredibly difficult to uh move protein around to the soldiers and one of the best ways of doing it was to dehydrate milk and send powdered milk and then reconstitute it with water it was easy to ship but then when the wars ended you've got all these dairy farms that have been built up to supply this incredible military effort and now those dairy farms are going to become bankrupt because they don't need that level anymore because the soldiers are home and and and, and the war is over So what does the government do at that stage? Well, they have to start subsidizing it because they don't want to create a huge economic problem with all these people going bankrupt and the farms going out of business and the land going fallow and people losing their jobs. So they now have to start subsidizing. And and of course if they're subsidizing it, they want to stop subsidizing it. So they have to try to figure out a way to make sure that they don't have to subsidize anymore. So the government begins changing the regulations and and suggesting that people increase their intake of milk because you know it would be good for the country. 
And incidentally, if this all sounds a lot like conspiracy theory, it happened now. This has been happening for over 100 years, but just recently, and I'm so sorry it's not top of my mind right now, but there was a country that I'm trying to think of that ended up with quite a big uh, um, uh, dairy surplus. Geez, do you know, I think it was India. I wish I could look it up now, but they ended up with quite a big dairy surplus um, to, uh, because of COVID. And so they started encouraging the people in their country to drink more milk. And um, hang on, I'm just trying to find this because I'd saved it in my notes here. Well, it's happening in America as well. Oh, look at this. It's actually happening all over the world because uh, uh, milk has oh. gone down and now. But in any event, I saw this campaign and, and it basically said, please drink milk, support your local dairy farmers. So you understand that the government's uh, um, biggest intention at that point is not your health. It's to save money on subsidizing or it's to save bankruptcies, prevent bankruptcies. And so largely milk kind of, you know, and then of course there's the dairy growers themselves. They, in America, they have a company called the Dairy Management Company and, and they have an annual budget that's designed to influence food regulations, food recommendations, legislation, education, and all of it. And their budget, when I wrote about them 15 years ago, probably in that book that you read, their budget back then was $165 million a year. That's not an advertising budget. That's not a marketing budget. That is a manipulate the educational establishment and the legislative body budget. It's a, it's a, it's a budget designed to increase the demand for dairy products, despite the fact that they're not good for people. So, and then in India, you have another twist, and that is that, you know, roughly half of India are, are uh, roughly half of the people living in India are vegetarian. And I don't know if you've ever looked at a vegetarian distribution map, but most of the people that are vegetarian in India live in the middle of India. And if the people live on the coastlines, they tend not to be vegetarian. And that's because they have seafood and fish and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. One of the reasons that milk drinking is so very popular in India is that um, if you didn't drink milk at all, even though it's not so good for humans, at least it has vitamin B12 and a full suite of amino acids. Because when you choose not to eat meat, you cause a problem, and that is B12 problems and amino acid problems or protein problems. And so milk can, in a sense, be a supplement to fix that. And that's one of the other reasons that milk has become so prolific in India, because if they weren't having milk, they would have even more significant. I mean, already India is, is uh, showing up as one of the like, major diabetes and obesity explosion happening in that country, and it needs to be dealt with. But it, things would be, in a sense, on a different metric, even worse if they didn't have milk consumption to deal with. But they're going to pay a price for it as well. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, having and consuming milk is kind of supplementing us some nutrients, but not having it will eventually deprive us of those nutrients, which is also bad. So how do we deal with that? I mean, if you want to replace milk and like, do we take supplements or how does- Well, I think there are, two, there, there are two very, there are two, there are two ways to deal with that. And the one is that you do everything you can. Look, look, I, I'm overly simplistic about this, but if you were to get yourself an exotic pet, you, you would not go do a bunch of research on the internet from scientific studies to find out what your exotic pet should be eating. You would just go watch National Geographic and watch the animal in the wilderness and then you'd know what it needs to eat. And, and what I would suggest to you is that if you really want to get things right with the human body, what you wanna do is take a look at what humans have always been eating for, for not, not for the last few thousand years, but for the last hundred thousand years and, and, and mimic that as closely as possible. Our ancestors were not drinking milk. They were not supplementing milk to make up for their lack of B12 or their lack of, of whole proteins because they were getting B12 and whole proteins from things like eggs, from fish, from meat, and so on. And, and so the problem, of course, is, is that in a culture that is attempting what I think is a fairly dangerous experiment, and that is like nationalized vegetarianism, you're going to have to find a way to supplement. So now, if you want to come off dairy products, you're either going to have to eat the occasional eggs or meat or fish, or you're going to have to supplement. You're going to have to find a way to get your nutritional needs met uh, through some unnatural means because they're not available another way. So you're going to have to take B12 shots or B12 supplements, and you're going to have to make sure that you're getting all, not, not just protein, but whole proteins with all the amino acids. Of course, the easiest way to do that is with animal products, but some people don't want to do that. So they're going to have to figure out a supplementation path. That's interesting because we have a wide variety of vegetarians, egg vegetarians, non-vegetarians. 
and that too we have categories of people who eat a lot of different kinds of foods yeah so india is really a diverse country when it comes to like eating habits especially in the south they all they eat is idli sambar dosa i'm not sure if you know of it dosa no so that's like a south indianized form of dishes they've been eating it for for while now and that's like their most interesting dish so you know like knowing all of this we understand food psychology we understand nutrition what do you think is the human diet i mean as you say every species on earth has a diet what is the human diet so the first time i had that thought um a few different things influenced me um i had read an article by a guy named s boyd eaton and he'd written it in about 19 Uh, 84 I want to think and I read it in the early 90s when it made its way onto the internet and he he sort of suggested that that idea that there there might be a, spe- a species specific diet and that the key might be to look at our anthropology or to look at our our history but then the other thing that really woke me up to it is I I do a lot of wildlife photography um mostly Africa but I've even I've been to both Soreska and Rantambore in India to to you know mm-hmm. to look at um elephants and tigers and all this kind of stuff there. And one of my trips I was heading to Africa and I was reading an article on the plane and it was about um elephants and they were talking about how when they first started capturing elephants and putting them in zoos and circuses and stuff that the elephants would usually only live like 6 or 7 or 8 years, maybe 10. And that seemed okay because it was enough time for them to recover their investment if they paid x and they made 2x in 10 years then you know whatever, right? And um and then though as people started understanding nature they started learning that elephants can live like 7 or 8 years and all these like zoo owners and circus owners like holy crap if i could get my elephants to live for 7 years i wouldn't have to buy them so often so what do i do and the article went on to describe how how they how they extended the life of these captive elephants and the way they did it was they they started examining the way elephants live in the wild and the in the article they talked about the elephant's wild diet and the um elephant's captive diet and that really kind of irritated me because grammatically the elephants don't have a wild diet they have the elephant diet and that that thought triggered something in me and it was like wait a minute we use the word diet incorrectly if we're watching a nature program we use it correctly the the nature announcer comes on the comes on the show and he goes Here we've got the cheetah, the fastest land animal in the world. Its diet consists of eating 2.5 kilograms of fresh impala on a daily basis. I mean like they know how to use the word diet. They use it correctly. We go, "Oh, Sally would like to go to her wedding." And so she goes on a diet to try to fit into her dress. Like that's the wrong use of the word. Diet means way of life and lifestyle. And as I'm having this thought on the plane, I'm like, "Wait a second now. Every species on earth has evolved both the ability to extract and the need for certain nutrients and as long as the species is adhering to those principles it's going to experience maximum health and the degree to which we take that species away from its evolved lifestyle is the degree to which it's going to suffer sickness and probably premature death like the captive elephants and so you ask what's the human diet well this is not a mystery it's controversial because it's an inconvenient truth that people don't want to hear sometimes but the archaeological record is absolutely clear about this humans have uh, largely been nomadic hunter gatherers that have um had an omnivorous uh, omnivorous lifestyle they they they've hunted big game and meat and fished and 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 eggs and so forth and then they've also eaten seasonally available uh tubers and fruits and vegetables and that sort of stuff and nuts and that's that's it that's the human diet i mean we can get into more detail about what the ratio should be like and what the season should be like and so on but the human diet does not involve chocolate it doesn't involve milk or cheese it doesn't involve refined sugar now of course these days it does but again the degree to which we stick to our originally evolved diet is the degree to which we're going to be healthy you know before i ask you the last question what will happen if we eventually take control of our eating habits and and nutrition what will eventually happen on an individual basis on an individual basis and on a global basis Well, I think on an individual basis, uh there are a number of things that happen. One is that the body's functionality improves dramatically, inflammation is reduced, uh, immune system uh, gets stronger, uh um 
physically things work better. And then uh, also um, emotionally things start to work better. One of the biggest things that we've seen, the, the third highest reported benefit of, of, of doing the Wild Fit Coaching Program, that people that are clients on their own surveys, like this is not a survey that we created, it's a survey that we created and then they edit. And the third highest, the third most common benefit of changing their relationship with food had, was an increased sense of well-being. And then, of course, if you dive into that, it means that people's depression was ended, their sadness was, you know, ended. They 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 feel happier. And so, when you get your relationship with food right, your physical body falls into line, but so does your emotional body. And then, of course, as your emotional body uh, kicks into line, it means that you have less empty cravings and you're 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 of a better temper and you're a nicer person. And generally speaking, the cultural the culture improves. Uh, you know, here's kind of a weird twist: is that when people are missing certain key nutrients, one of the side effects of that can be aggression particularly when people are running low on certain amino acids or vitamin B12, they become particularly aggressive. And probably that's an evolved response to make sure that they got their share, right? To make sure they got their share. But in an ironic twist today, people are going on diets or macro restriction diets. Like I'm going to be a vegan and I'm going to give all this stuff up, which is their right, of course. But then if it causes a certain level of malnutrition in them, that same level of malnutrition creates antipersonal behavior. And that antipersonal behavior was supposed to help them get their share. That aggression was supposed to help them make sure they get enough. But now that aggression is just causing people to fight with each other in, in, the, in the grocery store or whatever. So I think that on the, on the human level, we, we see a dramatically improved uh, quality of life on the human level. Now, as we start talking globally, we see a dramatic reduction in healthcare costs. I mean, India is, I don't know how India is gonna survive the diabetes and obesity epidemic that's coming. I don't know how they're gonna afford it because I can tell you America can't afford it. If you wanna look at how much, uh, you know, uh, diabetes is, we, diabetes is costing America over 300 million, sorry, $300 billion a year. It's, it's, it's gonna bankrupt the country and it's a completely preventable disease in the case of type two. So, so India is gonna go through that same thing. So on a global level, when people start to eat the way their bodies were intended to eat, we're gonna see a dramatic reduction in strain on the healthcare system. Frankly, and this is unpopular to say, I believe the only reason COVID-19 has even been a problem is that so many people in the population were already sick, so they became good transmitters. If, if you take a room of 100 people and none of them are obese and none of them are diabetic, then statistically speaking, we know that very few of them are actually going to develop COVID symptoms, even if they contract the disease. So we know that, that, that that's what the science is telling us. That's what the statistics are telling us. But here's the really weird part is that if they don't contract the symptoms, they can still spread the disease, but not so easily because they don't cough and sneeze. But the minute we say, well, wait a minute now, out of our 100 people, 10 of them have obesity and 10 of them have diabetes. Those 10 now get very sick and they cough and sneeze on top of everybody else. They make the disease more spreadable. Now, if half of the people have diabetes and, and they're obese, and by the way, the numbers are like that. Talking about one third of Americans are dealing with diabetes at the moment. Like that's one of the reasons that I think COVID has been so unbelievably devastating because the human population's immune system is weak. And so I think, again, on a personal basis, you see improved quality of life. And on a global basis, we see a massively improved quality of life and a hugely uh, uh, stronger population with dramatically dropped uh, Medicare costs for sure. And of course, I know there are people out there going to go, but Eric, it's not sustainable for us to all go out and eat meat or all of us to eat an origin based diet. And what I would say to you is that that's incredibly good vegan propaganda because it's not meat farming that is terrible for the environment. It is monocrop farming that is terrible for the environment. If you farm one crop in an area, you are doing something that's ecologically impossible and it will destroy that area. The only farming that works for proper sustainability is farming that mimics proper ecological function. And of course, that's full spectrum farming that includes animals. And so again, if everybody was eating an origin based diet, we would see farmland returning to health, we would see carbon emissions going down, and, and so on. And, and I just want to say, I think it was, um, hang on, my line went funny. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah I am. I think it was Bill Gates the other day that said, like, um, 
you know, it's the cows that are causing all the CO2. Oh no, he doesn't talk like that. It's like the cows are causing all the CO2 emission and da, 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 da. And I'm like, you know what, Bill, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to get two garages and I'm going to go get a cow and put it in my garage and seal the garage up real tight. And I'm going to stay in the garage with that cow overnight. I'm going to take a car and I'm going to put it in the other garage and seal it up tight and put you in the garage with that car and run that overnight. Let's see who's still alive in the morning. Cows are not the problem. Now, I'm not saying that the current farm of uh, the current methods of farming cows is a good idea, but in a proper regenerative farming environment, they're not a problem. They're actually good for the environment. Wow. So, Eric, what's the impact that you want to have in the world? I'm sorry, what was that? What's the... What's the impact that you want to have on the world? What's the impact I want to have on the world? Yeah. Oh, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't really have these massive delusions of grandeur. I mean, my, my primary impact that I want to have on the world is that I have the best possible fun and enjoyment that I can and provide that as an inspiration to the people around me. And then, you know, when I think about my missions and I think about the things that I'm trying to achieve, I, I, I really, there, there are two areas that I really hope to have a big impact. And one is I, 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 I want to dramatically improve the quality of life of a billion people on earth by helping them change their relationship with food and by changing food regulation and legislation and so on. And then I also, I'm really, really interested in education reform. I, I, I always wanted to be a teacher when I, um, when I was in school, but it was like, when I found out how little we pay teachers, I, I was like, I'm not doing that, you know? And, and now, um, now that I really effectively am a teacher, I just, I'm not teaching in the academic space. I, I wanna devote a lot of my energy now toward making sure that um, education reform takes place and that uh, children are getting the educations that they really need to set them up for the very complicated future that's in front of them. Thank you so much, Eric. This was incredible for sharing the incredible insights that you shared. And I hope that this is going to be really, really insightful for people who will watch this. And India is going to love this for sure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing the great work. And uh, um, I, I'm sure we'll cross paths again. <laughs>